Hello, everyone, and welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. Uh, accent on the lore there for some reason. I'm not sure why. Uh, because I, I will not be doing that. No, <laughs> you won't be doing any <laughs> no. any uh, uh, accents on the lore. Well, the, one of the guilds that we're going to be <laughs> talking about is very lore-centric, right? Uh, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. All right. Uh, so I'm Greg Tito, and uh, this is uh, Mr. Ari Levich. It is. It yes. is. All right, good. And uh, today in this segment where we talk about little bits of lore that you can bring into uh, your Dungeons & Dragons game or just for the fun of knowing it, uh, we're going to delve further into the guilds of Ravnica uh, in support of Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, which is coming out everywhere November 20th um, and uh, will be in game stores uh, 11 days before that. That's right. November 9th. Uh, so look for it. Um, but it is the first major product in which you can play Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game within the world of Ravdica from Magic the Gathering. It's pretty surreal to roll up characters like that, uh, choosing a guild and kind of just creating characters on d d using a D&D character sheet and seeing all the, the Ravnica kind of jargon is pretty fun. Right, because you have been a uh, writer for uh, and game designer for the Magic side yeah. of things. Yeah. And so coming into the Dungeons and Dragons world, it's they're all colliding. Everything's being great. Uh, we've done uh, two episodes of Lore You Should Know, two segments of Lore You Should Know on uh, previous guilds. Yeah. And today we're going to delve into uh, two uh, new ones, uh, and they are Azorius and Boros. That's correct. Uh, that's not their full names, but... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but there's a reason I chose uh, those two. And last time I was here, uh, we were talking about two different... We talked about kind of grouping guilds in these kind of um pairings yeah these kind of pairings um they're kind of like you know two sides of a, of a coin uh we talked about the simic and the is it being these science oriented guilds and you know, we talked about the selesnia and golgari being very much the relationship with nature and life and so we're starting with the azorius and the boros today um because uh these are the two guilds that are really responsible for maintaining kind of peace and order uh on the streets because when you have a much, you know, this giant plane spanning uh, metropolis uh, that Ravnica is, uh, things can get chaotic. And uh, so um, these are the two guilds that very much have taken it upon themselves to make sure that uh, peace is kind of the uh, status quo, even though it's very difficult. Um, hmm. So I want to talk about what separates them, and then I'm going to dive into into the two guilds. So okay. the, the big way we we think about them, or we thought about them when I was on the uh, the Magic team, was the Azorius being very much the letter of the law, and the Boros being very much the spirit of the law. Oh. And so what that means is, well, the Azorius, is, their full name is the Azorius Senate. And because they are the ones that also make the laws, they really take the letter of the law very seriously. Um and so uh, the Azorius, th their structure, their guild structure is very much, they have, or they're broken down into what are called three columns. And uh, I wrote it down just to make sure I get the columns correct. Nice. Um, so you have the, the Jelen column, which is the, the column that is responsible for creating the laws themselves. You have the Liev column, which is responsible for enforcing them. And you have the Sova column, which is responsible for, if, if the laws are being challenged, they serve as the judges uh, and so on. So you kind of have like, they kind of mirror the three branches of government kind of thing. They're not necessarily the official government on Ravnica, but they serve many of those functions. Mm. Um, and so, if you're a if you're a player, uh, you know who is interested in being part of the Azorius, you might be drawn to this notion of being a beat cop, of going <laughs> around, uh, you know, in the streets, kind of working your beat and maintaining the peace. Or you might like the idea. See, part of the Azorius is they, you know, they create these. They have this huge bureaucracy that is attached to this kind of, you know, lawmaking body, and it could be overwhelming. There's kind of this Kafka-esque experience of going through one of the administration buildings. But if you're part of the Azorius, you know how to navigate all of that. So there's this kind of fun notion that in all of this, you are kind of at home. Hmm. Um but they're they're big deal. I mean, if you are if you are a player who is interested in this, you are probably part of the Liev column. You are probably serving as an arrester if you wanted to be like a fighter or or a paladin, or you might be one of these law mages. Uh, these things called law mages, which basically um, uh, the law itself, the um, the the writing of the law itself, is imbued with magic, and the law mages of the Azorius could actually draw upon that power. 
Uh, so if you're a wizard, um, you might be a wizard uh, of the of the school of enchantment or abjuration who might protect you, you know your other cops in the streets or kind of. If, if their arrestor is kind of making a bust, you might protect the citizens to stop uh, more collateral damage, that kind of a thing. I love that the, uh, the authority figures or the people who are doing, you know, the execution of the law, they're called the arresters. Yeah, the arresters. Yeah. yeah. What do they do? They arrest. They arrest. Yeah. Keep the peace by arresting. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Azorius themselves, they, they'll have... Azorius prisons, those that are arrested by arresters and then gone through kind of the legal system. Um, they might be put in prison. Um, they, they have, the, you know, these Azorius prisons. Um, but there's this there's this kind of fun thing you could do if you're an Azorius party of being kind of a police precinct mm. or, you know, um, uh, sorry, I've been watching a lot of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So that's where my brain goes. Now no I want to play an Azorius thing. But you could you could pretty much you could imagine a, um, a an Azorius party that is very much that in in that vein. That they're uh, they're they're happy go lucky and uh, wanting to and make everyone laugh. Yeah. yeah, everything works out in the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all right, I can see that. Yeah, uh, is that the tenor of the guild though, or do they? Yeah, you know, is that going against type a little bit? Uh, it's probably going against type a little bit, but you know, n- nothing is monolithic. You know, you play the characters you want to play, but there is a sense that overall the Azorius take themselves very seriously. They are they very much believe that chaos is poison to civilization. And they are very much the guild against chaos. So, excuse me. Um, yeah, they believe that laws are kind of the bulwark against chaos, that executing those laws is the only way civilization will, will survive. And, you know, we're talking about a civilization that has existed for more than 10,000 years. So to them, they're like, that's just evidence that we're right. We're doing you it know? right. Yeah, so... Um, you know, at their best, they are those kind of peacekeepers. They are those, uh, they are, they're maintaining this, this uh, sense of order uh, on the streets of Ravnica. At worst, they can become, they are the tendency of the burdensome law, the dispassionate law that has that doesn't really take into account the citizenry itself. It kind of exists for its own sake and can become a police state. Um, so, you know, the other guilds always kind of keep them in check. And again, pe- members of the Azorius may also be aware of these tendencies and put laws to keep themselves in check and so on and so on and so on. Interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned that they're not the government per se of of the uh, entire plane of Ravnica that is a, a city and then of these guilds kind of fill up, you know, a lot of that. But so what uh, w- w- what is the government of 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 Ravnica in general? So I mean the, the main structure really comes back to the power of the guild pact. Uh, that's that magical kind of contract that, you know, 10,000 years ago, uh, the different uh, heads of the different, uh, the parents of the guilds signed this thing, basically maintains balance between between the guilds themselves. Uh, but day-to-day functions still have to happen. And originally, the guilds had more civic functions that ev- eventually kind of evolved into their own, um, kind of their own societies to a degree. Like uh, last week, we talked about the Golgari and the Golgari, main Golgari function was to kind of maintain, uh, kind of, kind of, honestly, like pick up the trash and make sure that, you know, sanitation things were taking, get, getting taken care of. And so in that vein, the Azorius had their function of administering uh, the uh, administering the city. The laws. So, the, yeah, the, the government exactly. city, right? But um, th- there's not, people don't just defer to the Azorius to, to rule, however. So it's not just like, the, you know, the, the Azorius are the ones on top at the moment. Um, it's more that they fill a lot of the administrative functions. I see. They create the bureaucracy that yeah. allows yep. the rest of the, the guilds to exist. Yep. Okay. Um, what uh, Are there very different types of people that join the like three little branches, like the Senate and the other areas? Um, so the, the the main races that are associated with, uh, with the Azorius are humans and Vidalkin. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they may be interspersed uh, throughout all th- or all three all three columns. So D and D players will be familiar with humans, clearly, right. but Vidalkin is 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 somewhat new. Yeah, Vidalkin. Uh, we we talked about them with the Simic, but for those who who didn't catch that one, uh, <laughs> the Vidalkin are one of the races that uh, are new to D and D, and they are kind of note noted by their their blue skin and kind of absence of hair, and um, they are they are very. Um, they're very logic based and they tend to be very studious and detail oriented, which is perfect for the Azorius. So if you are a Vidalkin, Vidalki- if you're interested in playing a Vidalkin and the uh, Azorius appeals to you, you will, you have created a perfect match. Um, and you will play, you can play two type with that very, uh, very well. 
Um, Makes sense. And like I mentioned before, most player characters will probably fall into the Liev column, being a rester or a law mage, because by nature you are out in the city as opposed to behind a desk. But it's interesting, there, uh, there's also a group, uh, uh, um, there's a role called Elocutor, and the Elocutor are these kind of orators that will kind of, uh, they, might, they might be emissaries or they might address, uh, they might be in a court and, and address, you know, an, an audience or a jury. And they're just great speakers. So if you, are, um, if you are a bard and you want to be part of like the College of Lore, this might be a good fit for you there. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And then, uh, you know, maybe uh, you won't have a lot of judges <laughs> right. uh, in, your, in, your, in your group. And not initially. Uh, one of the fun parts about, um, about the book is there's, we're playing with the renown system. And so, you know, you start as you're, you know, you're a guild member, but as you do more for your guild, you can build renown in your guild, and that gives you more, uh, it gives you, you rise in the ranks of that one. So at some point, you can become an arbiter or a judge, or an arbiter actually being, you know, in charge of a column, but you might, be, you, you might become one of the judges and all the power that you can wield with that as well. Nice. So there's a, a progression there. You yeah. can start as a lower level, uh, uh, you know, MOOC in the Azor- right. Azoria Senate and then you work your way up and there's and, a clear path. And every guild has that kind of renown system. Some are more hierarchical. Like when we talk about the Boros, it's very kind of a military hierarchy and we'll get into that. Some are flatter. We talked about the Selesnia last, uh, last time. And instead of necessarily rising in the ranks, you might uh, uh, get enough renown to fill a specialized role mm. in, in, in the guild. So the uh, Azorius Senate, uh, as you said, um, wh- where wh- what kind of spaces do they live in? Like, what 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 uh, do they have architecture that kind of feels, you know, what what the, the indicative of what their guild is? Yeah, uh, most guilds kind of have a look feel that's associated with them, both in costuming and architecture. Um, it, for magic, that that just fell out of being able to identify cards across the table from each other. Right. But what it really ended up doing is is it created uh, it really helped solidify the identity of, of all all these guilds. And so with the Azorius, you're going to notice a lot of kind of white marble structures with a lot of blue accents. Um, there are a lot of steps and there are a lot of uh, little hallways because there's a sense of always having to get to the next thing. The sense of bureaucracy, even kind of being built into their architecture. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna see that with like with Selesnya last week. There's a lot of the intersection of curated gardenscapes with a lot of um, right. kind of marble architecture as well. So every guild kind of has their own their own look feel. And Azorius uh, feels very much like um, uh, neoclassical, I yeah. guess, right? Like the idea that like oh, here's the columns and flutes that you might see in a Greek building, but more you know. E- even taking that further, there's always going to be that sense of uh, it, it looks functional. So it's not necessarily going to be as ornament as as ornament heavy, um, but it is going to be like this is made for a purpose, and cause, because why would you do it in any other way? Its beauty is you know is in its function. So, um, but even then, there's a way to it. Still feels like it's part of Ravnica. Like nothing, none of the guilds have something that really feels like it's not part of Ravnica, with the, perhaps the exception being the Gruul, who live in ruins and stuff. We'll, who we'll talk about. We'll get but, to them. Yeah. Uh, all right, so if you were going to play as an Azurius member, uh, is it, you know, obviously lawful is an alignment that makes a lot of sense, but are there characters that you could say are chaotic uh, within them? Uh, I, probably. Uh, I mean, you could you could make the argument for... for any, I mean, one of the, the fascinating things about Ravnica is that nobody is born into their guild, right? You choose your guild. Right. But you may choose for any number of reasons. I may be chaotic good, uh, but I'm getting pressured... You know, maybe both my parents were Azorius and just, I'm, I'm here. It may not be the best fit, but here I am. And there's a story to tell, right? Why, why am I this chaotic good person in the Azorius? Most people in the Azorius are lawful in some way, right? Th- to them, chaos is the greatest bad. Got it. So, um, but it doesn't mean you can't have chaotic characters in there. It just, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be weird for you. <laughs> you got to acknowledge that you're kind of playing against exactly. what the, the tenants are yeah. for whatever reason, whether you're, you're, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend joined the Azorias and you're like, I'm going to join too. But if you're, I mean, you might be the hot shot, you know, rogue cop or whatever. Right. It's like, cool. All right. All right. So there's trope space there. You're but Andy it's Samberg. A good yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, anything else you wanted to touch on the Azorius? Um, let me just check my notes. I think, I think we're good. Um, oh. I could talk actually uh, one last little bit if you're if you're not familiar with them uh the guild is the guild uh master is a a sphinx uh Esperia. Oh. and uh yeah she is not the parent so that means she's not the original uh the founder of the guild 
Um, she is the the current guild master. What and, uh, what can you tell me about her? Um, so she's somebody who didn't necessarily seek out this position. This was kind of something that had that found her. She was the most capable judge uh, at the time, and she has kind of risen to that. She's not she's not the most personable character. Sphinxes kind of aren't. Um, that that holds true in Ravnica, uh, but her wisdom as a judge is. Uh, is kind of legendary, uh, so she has been. She's taken up the mantle to be uh, to be the leader. And uh, those of you who are familiar with the the card set, this is somebody who we have seen in the original uh, card set for Ravnica. Came back and returned to Ravnica as well. That's oh, that's cool. Used. Yeah. So it's a long, it's a long yep. uh, uh, a character with a long history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are there sphinxes a lot in in Ravnica? Is that a common yeah. So. Yeah, there are sphinxes in Ravnica, and those that are associated with the guild tend to to be associated with the Azorius. It's not 100 percent. Some are ungilded and are just you know just sphinxes, but um, yeah, they are they tend to be associated with uh, with the Azorius. Oh, I didn't know there was an ungilded. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Again, joining a guild is a choice, and not everybody is. But you're not forced to join. Nope. Anyone. You nope. Could- yeah, you could you could just be you could be ungilded. Uh, the colloquial term in world is the gateless because they have no guild gate that they step through to j- go into their guild. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's talk about uh, the boros. So the boros are kind of the other peacekeeping um, guild on Ravnica, and they're much more kind of military in structure, but they are less about the letter of the law. They believe that justice justice is the highest good. So that means sometimes you may have to break the law to serve justice, which the Azorius might is called garbage because you, how do you, justice is the law to the Azorius. But to the Boros, their whole deal, if in D&D terms, if the Azorius are against chaos, the Boros are against evil, if that makes sense. So they'll, they'll, they want to root out um, corruption. They want to root out people who exploit others or they want to defend the weak. So the Boros are very much in that kind of uh, kind of Captain America space. Um, if you want to be the one that rushes, you know, the the kind of the uh, the one that rushes into the building to save the person, you know, the Boros are going to be very appealing to you. If you want to uh, hold the line against an incursion of, uh, of of gruel raiders coming out of the rubble belt, then you know the Boros are for you. Um, or if you want to kind of venture down into to the sewers, you know, as the, the knight in shining armor type thing, and you want to kind of uh, root out, you know, evil uh, in the undercity, then the Boros is also kind of going to be appealing to you. Hmm. And what, uh, uh, what kind of characters uh, generally gravitate towards the Boros? So uh, the Boros, in terms of races are, um, that you could play, are going to be uh, humans, Minotaurs are are, oh. are are very present in the in the Boros and occasionally goblins. Really? Yeah. How how uh, what's the goblins like on Ravnica? Um, the goblins. Uh, so the Boros are a very very much a fighty guild, but those goblins. Um, excuse me. Those goblins who have that sense of higher purpose might join <laughs> might join the Boros. So the Boros themselves are um, because in its military hierarchy are. The, at the highest ranks are the these battle angels. Uh, Aurelia, who's the guild master, is kind of the highest ranking among them. And they may inspire people to kind of take up the mantle, take up the cause of the Boros. And um, so, yeah, that, that, may, that may pull in some, some wayward goblins to, to join the Legion. Are there uh, a lot of goblins in Ravnica? Are they There are a numerous? lot of goblins. And a lot of goblins, uh, though, there are goblins in, you know, the Rakdos. There are goblins in the Izzet. Most goblins are actually guildless. Um, there are actually a bunch of like goblin gangs that also exist in uh, on the streets of Ravnica. Oh. Like the um, the adventure, the introductory adventure in the book, um, actually deals with kind of one of the more famous gang leaders, uh, a goblin named Krenko. So those of you that that know know the world of Ravnica, that's that's going to be a fun treat. Oh, that is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right, but so so the goblins that want to be a bit her- heroic and 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 try to uh, you know, elevate their, yep. their their status and the status of those around them to uh, to justice would would go towards Boros. Yep, and, and you know they'll tend to be kind of uh, there's kind of uh, when when battle is afoot, goblins tend to kind of get swept up in it. So they might be kind of the first to the fight. They may serve as uh, kind of forward scouts, that kind of thing. Neat. Yeah. 
Uh, you mentioned the, the the guild leader. What's what's what are they like? Yeah, so Aurelia is is a character that uh, who who we've seen before in previous in the previous card sets, but she is this she is the battle angel. Um, what's a battle angel? Uh, angels who do battle. Oh, yeah. All right. So like uh, Michael the archangel. I, I suppose. Uh, right? Is that the the trope, or yeah. is it more? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, but. There are different kind of classes of angels um, that, that show up here. Uh, there are um, war leaders, which is what Aurelia is, um, who will serve as, you know, leading large groups of soldiers. Then there are also fire main angels, which are kind of solo kind of big beaters that like if you need to deal with a problem, they will go deal with that problem. Send in the fire mains? Yeah. yeah. Is that because they have a main of fire? Yeah. yeah all right. <laughs> <laughs> the Burroughs are also kind of very, you know, yeah. <laughs> call it call yeah. it what it is. Call it what it is. Not yeah. a lot of poetry there, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, they they have this kind of military hierarchy, and it's broken down into different garrisons, and these garrisons have kind of jurisdiction over different parts of the city, and so uh, war leaders might lead like, might lead these gar- larger garrisons, or humans uh, who have or minotaurs or goblins even who have risen to these highest ranks might be given a garrison to lead. Um, and like a military, there are also different specializations as you kind of rise in these ranks. So uh, most most people are going to be soldiers. So if you want to be a fighter, uh, so if you want to be like a you know a champion, or if you want to be uh, uh, if you want to be like a paladin, or even an eldritch knight, because some of the, some soldiers uh, also uh, may combine their kind of martial talents with magical talents, and so this is kind of represented by paladins. Or uh, or eldritch knights, that kind of thing. Sweet. Um, there might, if you are a cleric of the uh, do, uh, light domain, you might uh, be a frontline medic. So you might serve with the soldiers to kind of make sure that everybody's going to make it through. Um, so there are all these different kind of specialized roles. So you could have a complete party. You could be a wizard who is an ev- uh, evocation wizard, and those are known as ember mages among you know among the Boros. Right. So you might specialize in you know in fire spells and lightning spells and to kind of break through an enemy line to allow kind of the soldiers, the rest of the soldiers to kind of pour through. So they've got that kind of fantasy warfare. Yeah, exactly. Thing going on. Exactly. Right, with the angels flying. And, yep. Right. Yep. All right. I can see that. Sounds like a fun, you know, uh, uh, easy in for storytelling. Absolutely. I mean, you can imagine the idea of a, a party being a squad, right. right? And all your adventures or your, your initial adventures could start from, you know, your commanding officer sending you on missions. You got to go do it. That's it, yeah. and then you know things can kind of unfold from there. Meanwhile, you know your your commanding officer is a minotaur. That's right. Yeah, or you're a minotaur. Or you're I'm all minotaurs. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. We're a group of minotaurs yep. fighting everything. Uh, all right, all else sounds really cool. What? Uh, uh, anything else on on Boros? Um, just the thing about them is, you know, if you're if you're if you are drawn to them, it's the idea of you are. D- you know, really much. You very much believe you are doing what is right. You are driven by this sense of justice. Um, Boros, as the villain, can sometimes be the one that, who can be blind to a bigger picture. Mm. That they can be directed to attack an enemy where they don't have necessarily all the pieces, and so they could be. Uh, sometimes they may, they you know, they may occupy part of the city because they think they're doing, they're doing. They're doing good or protecting from, you know, a larger incursion, but they may be doing more harm. So v- as a villain, uh, there, you could have a little bit more nuance with, you know, the knight in shining armor trope. What is this kind of military force that might that might show up? Do you, are they easily manipulated as um, well they, for that reason? They can be. Yeah. Yeah, they absolutely can be. I mean, they're driven by this, sen- by this sense of passion to do what is right. And that is that could be misguided. Yeah. Or it can shift. Or it can shift. On, okay, yeah. That was great yesterday, but now... You know, all these people will die from reactions. Yeah. Nuance makes that very complicated. The more complicated a situation gets, the harder it is to just say this is the right course and do that. Right. But when you have a military structure, they have to say this is the way it is, you know, and kind of go pursue that. So, you know, these really are two of the the, the same coin. You're totally right. Like the flip sides of of how. Uh, what justice and and morality even really mean? Absolutely. And so that's a fun thing. I and mean, you might have. You might have characters in the Boros who left the Azorius or vice versa, you know, because oh. these things, again, none, none of this is permanent uh, when you join a guild. Nothing, nothing is baked in. You're not born into any of these. So there, there's this, there is this notion of changing guilds as well as a thing that is possible. Oh, all right. Well, yeah. we'll have to delve into that. 
Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ari. If people wanted to get in touch with you and ask you more uh, detailed, lower questions about Ravnica, how could they do that? Uh, so right now I'm on Twitter uh, at Winnemall, W-I-N-N-E-M-A-L-L. I love that you say right now. Like, are you gonna? Are you changing that? I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I guess right now and for forever. You're yeah. changing your guild again. Is it? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Well, awesome. Uh, I love taking these dives into what's happening uh, in Ravnica uh, in anticipation for Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Uh, again, it comes out on uh, November 9th in game stores. So look for it there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to to learn more. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks.